Could a zombie apocalypse really happen? Are there viruses in the planet and animal kingdom that mimic the symptoms of zombies in popular culture? The Center for Disease Control and Prevention, the main national public health institute in the United States, has a zombie preparedness guide. When I first heard this, I was more than a little concerned. I always thought zombies were just a fun and wildly popular horror movie genre. But could a zombie apocalypse really happen? The concept of zombies or bodies reanimated after death originated with the Haitian slaves in the 1600s and 1700s who felt trapped in their own bodies and without the free will to decide their own movements. Stories of the undead eventually worked their way into the Haitian voodoo religion which suggested sorcerers could use them to carry out their dirty work. From the undead Haitian slaves of 400 years ago to the present-day zombies popular in television and films, zombies usually share few common traits. They have no sense of right and wrong, no ability to plan, and no impulse control, all of which indicates a lack of a functioning frontal lobe of the brain. They do, however, still have basic motor control and are driven primarily by hunger. While there are no viruses that can cause neurons to fire in an already diseased brain and thus reanimate the corpse, there are infectious diseases that mimic some of the standard zombie characteristics. While a patient is still alive, in particular, a genre of viruses called neurotropic viruses attack our brain and can make us act strange or aggressive. For example, rabies is already spread by a bite which will sound familiar to zombie movie lovers, and once contracted strictly affects the brain, leaving its victim aggressive and looking to bite others. Another neurobehavioral disorder, kluver bussy syndrome, has symptoms that include hyperorality, the urge to put inappropriate things in your mouth, and inability to recognize normal objects, dementia, and the tendency towards a confused, catanotic state while being prone to violent outbursts. Encephalitis, also called sleeping sickness, causes hallucinations and puts its sufferers into a catanotic state while making them prone to violent outbursts if roused. And while a real zombie virus does not currently exist, viruses do evolve. It is feasible that one could evolve, for example, if two viruses infect the same cell to cut off higher brain function and include starvation. Infectious disease can also have mutations just as our regular genetic, can which can give the disease an advantage, but a virus evolving into something that can affect even a dead body remains science fiction. Whenever a new virus is introduced into a population where there are no immunity, I think of the measles and smallpox brought into America in the late 100s and 400s from Europe. The virus is incredibly efficient and claiming its victims. The good news is that since, at least according to lore, a zombie virus would not be transmitted through the air, there is a higher chance of containing it. In work presented at recent meeting of the American Physical Society, scientists used standard disease model to estimate the ideal escape during a zombie outbreak. They assumed you needed to be bitten to become infected and that zombies can only walk and not say that. Take public transportation. The modelers determined that the Rockies would be the safest place to go since there are not a lot of people already there and they are challenging to get to. Big cities are the worst places to be immediately after an outbreak, but about a month later they become safer as infected move outward. You can check out scientists interactive tool called Zombie Town USA on the code sharing site GitHub where you can tweak input parameters like zombie speed and kill to bite ratio to see how fast infection would spread. While we only know of human viruses that cause at most zombie adjacent symptoms, there are certainly fungi in the planet and animal kingdoms that cause their hosts to act like zombies. A fungus known as Ophiocordycep likes to invade the bodies of insects like ants and takes over its host just in few days. The ant is then forced to climb up high and settle itself on a leaf overlooking the forest. Once the ant dies, the fungus bursts out of its head so that it can fall to the forest floor below and spread its spores widely into the process. It is certainly unsettling how the fungus can have so much control over a much more complex organism, the zombie ant, and so quickly entomologists believe the fungus appears to manipulate the ant's nervous system and control its neurotransmitters like dopamine which ultimately affects the ant's behavior. 
There is parasite wasp that lays its eggs into the bodies of the caterpillars after those eggs hatch. The wasp larvae eat the caterpillar body's fluids and then eventually eat their way out. Amazingly, the caterpillar doesn't die in the egg laying process and instead becomes a sort of zombie guard, warding off would be so predators from the larvae. So if zombies are still a far-fetched concept for humanity, what about that guide from the CDC? Why would the CDC invest time in science fiction? Well, it turns out that the zombie preparedness tips offered in the guide just happen to be the same tips that you would be using in an emergency, like an earthquake or blackout. The CDC uses the theme of zombie preparedness to engage the zombie-loving public in general preparedness planning and has found the technique to be quite effective. Thinking about fantastical issues like zombie virus epidemic also leads us to learn more about the capabilities of the human brain and body, as well as how diseases spread versus how to contain them.